grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior <coughs> Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text this morning comes from our epistle reading from Romans chapter 6. We read verses 15 through 23. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if a person that that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So far from God's holy word, we can be seen. <coughs> Dear fellow redeemed, beloved of God, the 1995 film Braveheart depicts the story of the Scottish warrior William Wallace leading his fellow countrymen in a revolt against the oppressive rule of the British. This film really portrays that natural human tendency to really revolt any sort of idea of slavery or of an oppressive rule. In that famous scene at the end, after Wallace has been captured and tortured by the British, he's given one last chance to cry mercy and to submit to the rule of the English. His famous cry of freedom in response to that offer speaks volumes. He would much rather face death than be under a brutal master. No one wants to live in slavery. No one wants to be a slave. Given the choice... We all want freedom, right? We all want to be able to do just whatever we want to do. We want to live our lives how we want to live them. Today, Paul reminds us that we have been released from that brutal and oppressive rule of the law, that brutal, oppressive rule of sin. And now we have freedom. We have freedom in our Savior. And so we have been set free. Set free to be slaves. Now, that doesn't quite sound right, does it? Maybe when you looked at the sermon theme this morning, you thought, that doesn't really make sense. Set free to be a slave. What does that mean? On the surface, it doesn't really make any sense at all. But as Paul describes in our text this morning, it makes perfect sense. So I want to begin by this morning then by giving you three choices. From the three choices that I'm giving you, I'd like you to consider what kind of a person you are. Are you a person with a sinful past? Are you a Christian purposely not living a Christian life in some respect? Are you a sinner that's struggling against sin? The truth is, we're all at least one of these. Probably, we're all all three of them. And that's what makes and that makes us just like these Christians to whom Paul was writing. The Christians that Paul was writing to in Rome were struggling with those very same things that we struggle with as people today. And so Paul has an important message for them, and it's also an important message for us because we're in the same boat. The bottom line here in Romans chapter 6 is that we are set free to be slaves. And this freedom that we have to be under God's rule is a very, very good thing. Prior to the words before us, then, Paul has been urging the Christians in Rome to be alive in Christ, to not let sin rule in their lives, to not participate in all of the ungodly things of the world, but to offer themselves, body and life, to their God. He says to them in the verse that comes right before the start of our text, he says, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. 
And then because Paul understands what's coming next, he begins our text with verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Paul here was prepared. He was prepared for someone who, when they were thinking about their faith, thinking about the forgiveness of sins that Jesus has applied to us, when people would think about that grace, that undeserved love that we all have, the fact that we have been forgiven for all of our sins, when people would start to think about that, they would think that they could live life however they wanted. Wouldn't have to worry about doing what's God-pleasing, but we could just go on and sin. Since we don't have to keep a bunch of laws from God, because Jesus has already made us perfect in God's sight by giving us his righteousness, the thought was that people could just go and do whatever they wanted, live however they want. After all, we're under God's grace. Now, if you think that kind of thinking is maybe far-fetched, listen to the words that Jude has for some New Testament Christians, verses 3 and 4 of his book. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. The people to whom Paul, Jude was writing in that letter, they were doing just what Paul warned against here. They were using the grace of God, and they were turning that into an excuse to do just whatever they wanted to chase after all of the pleasures of this world, any pleasure that they could find. They felt that because they knew God's grace, that they could live in immorality without any consequences. But Jude says what they were really doing by living like this is that they were denying their Savior. They were denying Jesus. Because of this, then, their eternal home would be held with Satan because they were abusing that grace of God. So what about you, have you ever been tempted like this? Have you ever given in to this kind of thinking? Have you ever said to yourself, well, I know it's wrong, but Jesus forgives my sins. Or I know it's wrong, but I'll just repent later, because I know that Jesus will forgive me. Any thought like this on our part is exactly what Jude was writing against. It's exactly what Paul is warning against here. It's that same attitude. When we think this way, we're taking the grace of God and we're making it into a license to sin. And Paul says, no, no, no. By no means, he says. May it never be would be a more literal translation. You don't want to do that. You'll die eternally. And this is where that slavery image then comes in in verse 16 of the text. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now again, if I were to ask you today if you feel yourself, that you're a slave or a servant, you would probably say no. We take great pride in our freedom in this country. It's what our country was founded on. And when we think of historic images of slavery, and especially those images of slavery that happened in our own country, we're uncomfortable. We're embarrassed of that in our own country, and we're glad that those times no longer exist. But the truth still remains, though, that each one of you and everyone in this world is a slave. It isn't just Paul that says this either. Our Savior Jesus says so as well. If you remember the Gospel reading from a few weeks ago, we were looking at the beginning of Luke chapter 16. And Jesus was speaking about earthly treasures and how we either follow after those earthly treasures or we can follow after the things of God. He concludes those comments then in Luke chapter 16, verse 13. He says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus says you're serving God and so, or something else. And that verb for serve there, that's that same word that means to be a slave. So 
you're a slave to one or the other. Paul says that you're serving either God or your sinful nature. Both of those, again, they use specific Greek words that talk about being a slave, being a servant, being in a position where your will is bound by something else and you're not in control. Have you ever thought of it that way? If you were to use that line of reasoning that says, I know that I can ask for forgiveness later, so I'm going to commit whatever sin that I have in mind, do you realize that you're not in control? I mean, it sounds like you are, but you're really not. You're listening to that sinful nature. That sinful nature that, yes, sadly still exists inside the child of God. And you're doing what it tells you, what it tells you to do. And that takes all sorts of forms. Whether it be sexual sin or abuse of the body through misuse of drugs or food or alcohol, lying, cheating, stealing, whatever else. You're making yourself a slave to sin. You're doing it willingly. You're handing over control to sin. And Paul quickly and very clearly says that that leads to death. If you live this way, if you allow sin to be your master, just as Jude said, you're really denying the Lord. And as a result, you'll die eternally. The other option before you is, of course, to be a slave to God. And Paul here does a beautiful job of reminding us that God has made us slaves to him. He pauses here from his argument in verses 17 and 18 to remind us all of who we are. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Paul was writing this to Christians, and, and, and so this letter applies to each one of us, and the reminder here is to remind each of us who have been baptized, who have come to faith through God's grace, he's reminding all of us to remember who you are. So are you a Christian with a sinful past? If so, rejoice with Paul and give thanks to God that though you were once a slave to sin, you have been set free to believe in Jesus' saving work. If you're a Christian that has ever used God's grace as a license to sin, thank God that that slavery to sin is over and you, and you trust Christ's saving work and that you live now to follow him. If you're a Christian purposely living in a particular sin and abusing God's grace, remember who God has called you to be in your baptism. He has called you to be His. He's called you to be His slave. The result of putting slavery to sin behind and obeying the teaching about salvation through Christ is that you have been set free. You've been set free from sin. And so now you are a slave. And I know that doesn't sound right, but it is. You no longer slavishly follow whatever that sinful mind tells you to do. Instead, you follow him. You do it obediently and willingly, not in and of yourself, of course, but you do it because of the love that God has shown you through the life and death of his son, Jesus. That's what it means to be a slave to righteousness. You want to serve God, who sent his only son to serve you by paying for your sins. You want to live a righteous life, that pleases God and results in blessings here and eternal blessings in heaven. Paul continues then in verse 19. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. In the same way that you used to live eagerly as slaves to sin, which just unraveled into more and more wickedness, you now live just as eagerly to serve him in righteousness. And this means immersing ourselves in God's word. First and foremost, it means that, studying God's word so that we know what God's will is. And there are other important things about studying God's word too. That's, that's his means of grace. That's what the Holy Spirit uses to mold our hearts so that we'll live the way that God wants us to live, and it even causes us to live that way. That Word of God is living and active and causes us to live for God. 
And that living for God is that holy life that the Savior wants to see from us. So that's why we gather to worship. That's why we gather together for our Bible classes. That's why you spend time reading your Bible at home. It's because that Word of God is living and active. It works in you so that you do what slaves to righteousness do. Offering yourself to God as a slave to righteousness has all kinds of applications for our lives. And it touches on every part of our lives. How we spend our time. What our priorities are. How we treat people. The management of every gift that God has given us. And that's everything, by the way. Because everything we have is from Him. Again, God outlines His will for our lives in His Word. Which means that a Christian will want to get to know that Word better and better if you desire to follow him and not chase after that sinful nature. Paul says that choosing that righteousness is the much better choice. He explains in verses 20 and 21, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Slavery to sin means that righteousness is not controlling you, and as Paul says in the last verse of our text, the wages of sin is death. How much better than verse 22? But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Sins of the past bring up feelings of shame and regret and are proof that we're not worthy of God's love. But what we couldn't earn... Jesus did. His life, his blood, his cross, all of that atoned for our sins. His sacrifice is that bolt cutter that removed that ball of chain, that ball and chain of our slavery to sin. In love, we look at him now with thankful hearts, and we don't even mind being called slaves to righteousness because our focus shifts from ourselves to our Savior. It has shifted because we know the benefit of a heart and life devoted to our Savior. Holiness. Eternal life. And just so we never get the impression that this right living, or this following after God, or this avoiding sin, just so we never get the impression that these things somehow earn our salvation, Paul reminds us in the last verse, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We struggle with sin, and at times we fall, but there is forgiveness in Jesus. That forgiveness of sin and eternal life, that, that forgiveness of sins and the eternal life is what we see up ahead as the gift from God, as being slaves to righteousness. Slaves to the sinful nature don't have any of that to look forward to. But thanks be to God that we, as slaves of righteousness, servants of Christ Jesus our Lord, children of our Heavenly Father, we do have that to look forward to. By faith in Jesus, we are free from being slaves to our sinful nature, and we are free to be slaves to righteousness through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.